Well, thank you everyone for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Lambert at the University of Utah. Uh, she's an assistant professor there. She is a leading expert on mantle heterogeneities and how mantle heterogeneities, especially recycled for us, participate in the differentiation process. And she's going to talk about some of that today. So Sarah did her PhD at Femo Ferrand in France and then came to the US uh, for a postdoc at Caltech. Then she moved to Lamont. Uh, then she did a visiting assistant professorship at UC Davis. And then she decided to take a break from the US. She moved to Cardiff University. And then again, she came back because she could help it. That's when she started her job at the University of Utah. And I know this will take a little bit of time from your talk, but I have a couple of things that I do want to mention. So I know Sarah from like the beginning of my PhD. One of her EPSL papers was one of the first papers that I read when I started grad school. And when you start grad school, you know, when you read a paper, you think the author is a celebrity. So that's what I thought. <laughs> about. Then I go to ATU. And I think it was after either my talk or her talk, I don't remember. I was this you know, new PhD student. So I walk up to her with courage and I say, hey, you know, I had some things to discuss. Do you think you have time? And she said, yeah, let's go to lunch. And I was floored because I thought a celebrity had just asked me out for lunch. So that was you know, my opinion of uh, Sarah. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is, of course, we collaborate in terms of research, but uh, thanks to the pandemic in some ways, We've developed a new form of collaboration, which is where her students from Utah enroll in our classes through Zoom at University of Arizona. So, you know, we had her students participating at Cow in my rock climate seminar last spring. And then her students are also enrolled in the subduction seminar that Mauricio Mihai and I, we are offering. And then our students, so Anka, Emily, Anna, and Arka, they actually took her advanced pathology class online last semester. So it's something, you know, it's a cool new thing that we started, and I think we continue that. So I won't take any more of your time, so just start talking. <laughs> Thank you, Elena, for this uh, very nice introduction, and thanks again for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here. It's my first in-person talk since 2020, so a little stress. I haven't done that for a while, actually. <laughs> so, and this is also kind of a new material I'm presenting, so I apologize in advance if there is some confusion at some point. Uh, I'm looking forward to continue this discussion after this talk and, um, and for tomorrow with all the things that I have, especially with the students. I'm, I'm excited to hear what you have done since, since past year. So, um, so uh, Today, I'm going to talk about mantle heterogeneity. As Alonia said, that's my thing. So, uh, the mantle is heterogeneous. We know it. The thing I want to focus on today is the lithological heterogeneity of the mantle. And so, uh, for that, I have. Oops. There you go. Yep. And so for that, uh, I'm basically going to uh, cut my talk in two different parts. The first part is a general introduction. Uh, and the goal of this general introduction is just to present what kind of tools exist to quantify and what has been used so far to quantify the mental heterogeneity, and also to introduce uh, some terminology to make sure that we are all talking about the same thing. And the second part, of this talk is going to be the main subject of this presentation, which is how can we use these new tools that has been developed this past decades, the transition methods, or how we call them the FRT. And so again, just to make sure we are on the same page, <laughs> just to make sure we are on the same page, a little bit of terminology. So when we talk about the mental heterogeneity, I have to say a lot of this matter that I'm presenting is this introduction. For those of you who took advanced technology, we look familiar for the first part of this talk. So um, when we talk about mental heterogeneity, we, uh, there are actually two main schools. There is one school that's going to consider that the mental heterogeneity is mostly chemical, which means that the mental is basically only composed of one lithology, peridotite, and what changes the bulk composition, and so the mineral proportion in this bulk periodotype. 
So we stay on this top part of the Stratton diagram. The second school is to oops, wait one way, sorry. The second school is to consider that we have mythological heterogeneity, and so that we have different types of rocks that are present in the mountain. And so just to clarify, uh, pyroxenite is a term that I'm going to use today to talk about anything that is not a peridotite. Okay, so it's a simplified way to see mythological heterogeneity, but it's basically what I'm going to do today. So just keep in mind that pyroxenites cover actually a very large range of composition in comparison to pyroxenite. Okay, so why should we care about pyroxenite? It's actually a very small proportion of the mantle. So if the mantle is anyway dominated by peridotite, why should we care if there is pyroxenite or not? The first reason is a geodynamical reason. Pyroxenite have many different origins, but the main one is basically the recycling of the oceanic lithosphere. So if you manage to get some material coming from the oceanic lithosphere, say relatively intact up to the source of the Mid-Ocean Ridge Basalt or OIBs, this is telling you a lot about the uh, recycling mechanism, mixing, steering, uh, convection scales that can happen in the mountain. The second reason is because of the melting behavior of pyroxenite. So pyroxenite represents a small fraction of the mountain, that is true. Based on mountain exposure, it's up to 10%, okay, max of 10%. But it's well known now that they have way lower solidus temperature. What that means is they will actually start to melt at a much higher pressure than a pyrolyte. So this is what is represented in this temperature pressure diagram. The black line represents an adiabatic path for the mountain, and the red line over there corresponds to the solidus of the pyroxenite versus in blue, the solidus of the pyroxenite. And so you usually start to melt the pyroxenite at higher pressures than the pyroxenite. But more importantly, and often less considered, the melting interval of pyroxenite, of most, most pyroxenite, is much shorter than the melting interval of a pyrolyte. And the result of that is the magmatic productivity of pyroxenite is much higher. So even if you have a small proportion of pyroxenite in your mantle, that could actually contribute a lot to the magma you are going to generate at the surface. Okay, so this is what is presented here, basically. A small proportion in the source can become a large proportion in the magma. Okay, so how do we trace pyroxenite in basalt? How do we quantify what is the proportion of pyroxenite derived in melt that contributed to the formation of the basalt? Let's talk about mantle heterogeneity in general first. Isotopes are telling us that the mantle is heterogeneous. There is no question. This is a traditional plot where you have the neodymium isotopic ratio versus the strontium isotopic ratio. Heavy isotopes do not fractionate during fractionation processes such as partial melting and uh, fractional crystallization. So if you do see a range of variation of isotopic ratio in basal, this range of variation must exist in the source. But what isotope is not telling you is what kind of heterogeneity produces this signal. Is it a chemical heterogeneity or is it a lithological Heterogeneity. You won't know that from isotope. Not the same thing. So, this one was a plot showing the OIVs, but we can actually have the exact same conclusion if we look at composition from mid ocean ridge. Okay? Both mantle sources are actually heterogeneous. What about trace element? Incompatible trace element that we use a lot to constrain the melting behavior of the mantle. But the problem of incompatible trace element is they are extremely sensitive to two parameters, the bulk composition and the melting regime or the melting degree. And so to illustrate that, I'm showing you an example where, where what I did is I basically took one bulk composition, so that the same bulk composition in three different calculations. What's changed is the nature of the pyroxenite component in the source. So the bulk composition is the same, 
the nature of the pyroxenite component is different. And so you have one pyroxenite that starts to melt at very high pressure. You have another one that starts to melt at much lower pressure. And you have another one that even starts to melt slightly after the development. If you look at the trace element concentration generated by this, by the melting of that, the dash line represents the first percent, the, the first uh, one percent of melting for these three lithologies. So yes, the ones that, for example, start to melt, the third configuration over there is going to produce a melt that is very, very different from the two uh, other configuration, simply because in this configuration, the lithology that melt first is a paleotite, while in this configuration, the lithology that melt first are pyroxenite. But the thing is, it's very unlikely for you to actually collect this 1% melt. Usually, you get an aggregated magma. Maybe you got lucky and in the melt inclusion, you can find this very fractionated melt that corresponds to very low degree of melting. Most of the time, when you look at basalt, you have the composition of an aggregated basalt. And so that's what is represented by the solid line this time. And as you can see, there is not so much difference between the three configuration, despite very contrasted melting behavior of this uh, three different pyroxene. What about major elements? The problem of major elements is a lot of the melt, a lot of the melt that are produced by pyroxene and pyroxenite overlaps. The reason for that is because in a, even if the mineralogical assemblage are very different <coughs> between pyrotite and pyroxenite, they have basically the same phase present in the, in, the, in, the, in both type of rocks. You will still have both pyroxene and aluminum phase and potentially some olivine, which means that the melting reaction are going to be actually quite similar between the two different lithologies. And that explains why we have so much overlap. So, this figure, sorry, taking my breath. <laughs> <laughs> this figure presents a compilation of experimental melt. In yellow, it's melt produced by pyroxenite, and in green, it's melt produced by pyrotite as a function of silica, iron, calcium, aluminium, and titanium, TiO2. And as you can see, there is a lot of overlap between the two. So if you just look at the composition of the melt, which is likely, by the way, if it's a basalt, a contribution of these two lithologies, it's going to be hard to find what is the dominant lithologies in your average basalt. For the record, all these parameters, silica, iron, calcium aluminium ratio, and TiO2, have all been proposed as good proxy to actually estimate the proportion of pyroxenite in the source and in your belt. And as you can see, it's not going to be that easy. More recently, there is a new parameter that came in by Yang et al. And the formula is here, so I'm not going to detail that, but it's basically based on log ratio. And this new parameter, still based on major element, is amazing because if you look at that, this is a distribution as a function of this particular ratio for the same comp compilation of pyroxenite and pyridotite derived melt. And you can see that you have actually more than 65% of the pyridotite melt that only overlap with 15% of the pyroxenite melt. And you have more than 55% of pyroxenite melt that only overlap with 5% of pyridotite melt. Okay, so it's quite good, but we still have a huge overlap for this middle composition. So we still have a problem with major element. The second problem we have with this parameter is it's based on what is available in the literature. It's a compilation of experimental lens. And there is way more data on silica uh, rich, basically, uh, lithologies, the pyroxenite that produce this kind of uh, high value in this parameter than on silica deficient pyroxenite. Similarly, you have almost no experimental data on refractory Arsbergite melting, which is the dominant lithology of the continental lithosphere. And there is more and more study now that suggests that melting of the continental lithosphere can actually be a significant part of the 
generation of continental basalt. That's it. And so what's going to happen is if you take that into account, a melting of a Mars burgeite, a refractory Mars burgeite is going to produce a melt that is more silica rich than a typical lazolite. And so this is going to go this way. Inversely melting of the silica deficient kerosenite is going to produce a, a, a parameter, this parameter that will go in this lower value. So by actually taking Again, more into, more into account the whole range of heterogeneity that you can have in your mantle, you are even more overlap than what exists over there. Okay. The last tool I want to really talk about is the use of transition metals or FRTs, and that's going to be the subject of this, uh, of this talk. And uh, so the use of FRTs to actually identify the lithology of the source of the basalt has been, uh, forget my word, has been um, suggested uh, in the 90s, something like that, but it really became actually popular with the Sobolev et al. paper in 2005 and 2007, who basically suggested that you can use in particular the nickel and the manganese concentration to estimate and quantify the proportion of pure cement behind your source. This has been developed later on to other transition metals, such as zinc, cobalt, scandium, etc. Mostly thanks to the work of Veronique Leroux, who worked both on natural samples and experimental samples. And I'm going to I'm not going to explain this too much because that's the subject of the of the talk. Before I explain what we can do with FRTs, I just want to summary this introduction. And so what we have is that. So what are the tools to actually trace lithological heterogeneity of the mantle? Isotopes is telling us if the mantle is heterogeneous or not. Chemically, it is not going to tell anything about lithological heterogeneity. I, uh, incompatible trace elements are usually too sensitive to um, bulk composition and melting processes to actually be very useful again in this in this particular question. The major element can be promising, but we still have a lot of overlap between pyroxenite um, and peridotite melt. And so FRTs seems to be one of the best tools today to actually identify the presence of lithological heterogeneity in the mantle. Okay, so what are FRTs? So FRTs <coughs> are the transition metals, and so that's the first row of the periodic table over there. And so what makes the L40 so particular? There are actually two things. First, they are not actually that, but they are not very incompatible or very compatible for, for the average mental lithologies. They are basically, they behave with a neutral behavior. So, so the result of that is they are not going to be that affected by degree of melting, melting, matching, etc. So that's a big difference with the uh, RE, for example. The second thing is they have contrasted behavior, partitioning behavior, depending on the mental phases. So for example, if we consider zinc and manganese, manganese tends to be more compatible in garnet than in other minerals, and zinc slightly prefer olivine. So what you will have is a different distribution of these elements inside the different phase that can be present in the mantle. So why is it important? Okay, let's consider a bulk composition. So you have a certain concentration in manganese and zinc in your mantle. If you have a peridotitic source, manganese, there is not so much garnet. So manganese is going to behave as an incompatible element and zinc is going to be slightly more compatible. And so what you are going to create is a magma that has a high manganese zinc ratio. If you have now a pyroxenic lithology, which is dominated by garnet and you know, pyroxene, manganese is going to be compatible, zinc not so much. So what you are going to generate is a magma with a low manganese zinc ratio. Okay, so this is a theory. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Simply, 
first because the partition coefficient depend on temperature. I told you every little nucleus in the mantle do not melt at the same temperature, so you can see that you already add a level of complexity to this theory. This figure presents the partition coefficient for manganese as a function of the uh, magnesium content in the liquid. This is a paper led by uh, Anania, by the way. And, uh, and so what those represent are uh, experimental events. And each symbol corresponds to a different phase. And each color corresponds to a different lithology. Let's not focus about the lithology so much yet. Let's focus on the phase or on the symbols. And what you can see is for a given MGO, the, you, you see triangles on all this range over there, and you see diamonds on all this range over there too. Okay, what that means is for a given MGO, you can basically reproduce the entire range of partition coefficient for manganese for the, all the different minerals. So it's going to be hard to differentiate between those. A way to deal with this problem is instead of working with partition coefficients, so the equation is given here, okay? We are going to work with exchange coefficient, which is basically a ratio of two partition coefficients. So we are looking at exchange between two elements. So those are the same data, still the MGO content on the X axis and on the Y axis, you have the exchange coefficient. And what is important here is again, the symbols, not so much the color. And as you can see, all the triangles are basically on the bottom of this diagram. All the circles are on the top of the diagram and you don't have that much overlap between the different symbols. So what this is telling you is actually that the exchange coefficients are not dependent on composition. And by the way, they are not, they seem that they are not dependent on temperature either because the MGO leak, the, the concentration of MGO in your melt is a proxy for the temperature of the mantle. Okay. So, looks like this would be a good way to have a relatively simple system. What about other FRTs? This is for manganese iron. Well, for other FRTs, it's not so clear simply because we have way less data, basically. So these are basically the data that we have for zinc as a function of the temperature and the exchange coefficient for zinc iron uh, as a function of the temperature again. Uh, those are the work by Leroux et al. 2011. And so when you look at this data, if you look at one particular bulk composition for living, for example, you might see some trend. So you might see some temperature dependence with the partition coefficient, but uh, with such error bar, it's actually quite, quite hard to tell, basically. And same thing with the exchange coefficient. We, we seem to have different value depending on which mineral phases you are looking at. But again, with the error bar, it's hard to, it's really hard to tell. So what do we need? We need more data, but pandemic, so, <laughs> so the initial plan was to do experimental data, uh, no access to the lab, blah, 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 blah. So we change the project and we say, okay, we don't have access to the lab. Can we actually use what is already available? And in particular, natural samples to see if we can say something about the behavior of these FRTs. So this is a project led by Otto Lang, sorry, who was a uh, master student in my group and actually graduated last summer. And, uh, and so he tried to answer two different questions. The first one, as I said, can we use a global database of natural mental <coughs> samples to determine the FRT exchange coefficient? And the second question is, if we can do that, how can we use these FRTs actually to, to actually quantify the lithological heterogeneity in the model? Okay, so this sum up basically what I'm going to present now. And, and so the first thing he did is he looked at natural data from the Erskine database. We also did some uh, new analysis using a high current setup to make sure that we have high precision analysis, etc. And he tried to apply this result in a very, very, very simple model just to see if with the most simple scenario, does it work? Okay, so 
plotting, we take all the data we have and we plot them in a plot. So this is a manganese up. This is a manganese iron ratio in different minerals, garnet, ortopioxane, olivine, and spinel, as a function of the manganese iron ratio in pinopioxane. <coughs> We are looking at natural samples. We don't have many anymore, so we are looking at exchange coefficients between minerals. Okay, and so you remember the definition of the exchange coefficient. It's a ratio of uh, partition coefficient. So you can actually rearrange this formula, and you get this formula. So on such plot, the exchange coefficient is simply the slope of this regression. Going through zero. Okay, that's how you are going to find your exchange coefficient. Okay, each mineral seems to define a trend, but there is clearly a lot of overlap. And how are you going to define the exchange coefficient for Garnet, for example? You can go from over there to over there. You have several of the order of magnitude of value for this exchange coefficient if you look at, um, at this natural data. So what I'm going to try to do now is convince you that this scatter doesn't actually really matter. And the way I'm going to do that is by first looking at where this scatter is coming from. And for that, we are looking, we are going to look at intrasample variability. And so that's what Otto did. So he did actually high precision data on a large set, large set, no, not a large set, small set. <laughs> <laughs> Of, of, of xenolites from different geodynamical contexts. So we have uh, xenolites from uh, San Carlos, we have uh, uh, clinopyroxenite from an ultramassive massif, uh, ultra massif, massif penibuxera, we have arclogite, we have eclogite, etc. Et et and so what he did is he, he did actually probe analysis, but with very high current in a two step setup. And we have actually demonstrated <coughs> that uh, this way to actually analyze samples is uh, consistent with the results that we got with the laser ICPNS. So we can have actually good zinc data, for example, using the electron probe with this particular set. Okay, so there is a lot of information on this plot, and I'm not going to go over everything. What I want you to look at is not the same plot, manganese iron ratio for different minerals, manganese iron ratio for phenopioxen. And this square is actually all the manganese iron ratios that you can have for one given samples by considering all the pair garnet phenopioxen that can exist in this sample. Keep in mind that we are looking at samples that are relatively fresh that there was super high quality data, super high precision data, and that at every point, because it's in situ and it's pop, so the spot is the focus basically, was carefully um, uh, selected to be inclusion free, fracture free, etc. Still, in one sample, we have all this pair of ratio that can exist. Okay, this is telling, telling you directly something. If the sample is not well equilibrated. Okay, you have a lot of disequilibrium uh, happening in this sample. The problem is if you take this one sample and you try to estimate the KD, so the exchange coefficient, if you take the two extremes, you could basically have a value that is going to be 0.1 to a value that is going to be 100. You have all this range of, of exchange coefficients that can exist in one sample. But if you look at the average of the sample, actually two samples containing garnet. So that's this regression line between two samples. You see that in comparison to the KD we obtain using the whole compilation, we are not that off. We are off, but we are not that off. So technically the problem of using global database is the samples are not necessarily in equilibrium. They are not well equilibrated. And so how, to deal, how do you deal with that? <laughs> the first take home, take home message of this is you should definitely not use one analysis in one sample to get your key. That's not a good idea, whatever the precision of your data is, actually. The second thing is two samples, oops, sorry, two samples is still not enough. Clearly, we are still off in comparison to the range of exchange coefficient for sure. 
So the question is how many, how many samples do we need to analyze to have actually a good estimation of the, of the key? I didn't do a full statistical an analysis for that. I just did a very simple exercise. What I did is, this is basically, okay. This is the range of k I could get if I was taking one sample, an average sample, not one analysis. Every point knows that this is a global data set. So we are not looking at individual analysis, we are looking at individual samples that are already average of multiple points. Okay. But if I take only one sample, I can actually estimate in my exchange coefficient. And of the problem by doing that is my range is going to vary from 0.7 to 25. So basically, I don't know what is my exchange coefficient. Now I take 10 samples. So what happened in this plot is every of these green line corresponds to 10 randomly chosen samples. In the whole database, every of these green line corresponds to 10 of these randomly thing. And if I look at the value of this loop, I already reduce it by a lot. Now the range goes from 0.7 to 25 to 1.1 to 2.3. Okay, so it's already much better. I continue to do that to see how many I need. For this particular example, when I reach 40 samples, I actually match the estimation I got from my KD for the entire compilation of samples, which about 500 samples, actually, okay? Don't take those 40 samples as the absolute number of analysis you need to do uh, if you want to estimate the exchange condition, it was just a small exercise. The takeaway message of that is a little bit controversial in comparison to all the analytical development we do today and all the precision we can get, etc. That well, what this is telling you is if you use natural sample, quantity is better than quality, basically. You it doesn't matter if you do super precise analysis on one particular sample, if it's not perfectly equilibrated and no natural samples is perfectly equilibrated. If you do one analysis, you are very likely to get a bad result for your team. But if you take a bunch of samples coming from different localities, et cetera, et cetera, and you do not so precise good analysis, but not so precise analysis on many samples, you will have a much better estimation of your key. Okay, so that's what we did. Okay, so we did this regulation for all this, uh, all this KD. And so what you see is when you do that, the, so what's important not to look at is this range. And as you can see for each mineral, you have a relatively minimal overlap between these minerals, which means that we have now a good estimation of the KD, the exchange coefficients for every mineral. We can also compare what we get as coefficient between natural kaosanite and natural paleotype. And we have a Including the error, we have a perfect overlap between paleotype and paleotype, which confirm that we don't have actually a dependence of composition on this exchange coefficient. We can also compare that with the experimental data. And olivine is good, autopyroxene is good. Garnet, not so much. But there are actually very few experimental data dedicated to FRTs. So this includes a lot of experimental data where manganese has been analyzed, but I mean, 10 years ago, 20 maybe, nobody cared about manganese basically. So technically if it, if it was 1.1 or 1.3, we were okay as long as our total was fitting. And unfortunately that include this kind of thing. So for the KD for Garnet, I would actually trust more the one obtained on natural samples than the one obtained on experiments for now until we get more experimental data dedicated to FRTs. Okay, uh, what about other key, other FRTs? Well, we have much less data and that's the same thing with experiments. So this is an example with uh, zinc, for example. But despite the lack of data, we still have a good distinction between an assemblage that's going, an assemblage that is going to be dominated by the CPX and the RNET, such as the pyroxenite, and an assemblage that is going to, going to be dominated by olivine 
au PX à l'histoire, as expected for phylotype mentoring. Okay, so we have good estimation. Good. <laughs> we have good estimation uh, for KDs, so thanks to the, so to, to, to the natural samples. So, what can we do now? So, that's the last part of this tool. Can we actually use these exchange coefficients to quantify the lithological heterogeneity in the model? And so, to do that, what I did is I chose, as I said, it's a um, it's a very just a proof of concept. So this part is a very simple model. And what we did is we choose two lava suites, okay, that show contrasted uh, zinc iron ratio and manganese iron ratio. Okay, so Samoa show a high zinc iron ratio and a low manganese iron ratio. Iceland shows the opposite, a high manganese iron ratio and a low zinc iron ratio. So if you follow what I say at the beginning of this presentation, that means that Samoa in theory should represent a source with a higher proportion of pyroxenite and Iceland should have a mortal lithology dominated by something that is closer to a pyrolotite. The way to deal with mortal heterogeneity, the classical ways that we have done, I have done many times, is to look at something like that. You have a two lithology model, okay, pyroxenite and pyrolotite, and you try to determine what is the proportion of pyroxenite in your model by looking at your basal composition. So you have to, you do a reverse problem like that. If you want to do a reverse problem like that, and, you, and that's your question, there are several input parameters that you need to see. And those are the composition for each lithologies, and the mineralogy for each lithologies, because lithologies are very, are very contrasted melting behavior depending on the mineralogy. And you also need something such as MedPX to actually solve from what is the proportion of pyroxenite derived melt in my basalt versus what is the proportion of pyroxenite derived melt in my mountain. So this is what, what has been done, what I have done for, for many years. What we did for this particular model is something different. We actually don't look at a heterogeneous mountain yet. We are just trying to figure what is the average mineralogy of the source. So we don't have lithological heterogeneity in the mountain yet, just the average mineralogy. And so in this case, the only input parameter is actually the bulk composition of your mountain source. You don't have to assume the different composition of your different lithologies in the mountain, and you don't have to assume what are the mineralogy of these different lithologies. So this is what we did here using, for example, the manganese iron ratio. So the two color corresponds to the two series of data. It's a ternary diagram with olivine, OPX, garnet, and CPX for a batch melting model, I told you, a simple model. The size of the bubble is correlated to the Garnet CPX ratio. Okay, so just to explain this part. And so the bubbles are basically showing you all the lithologies, all the average mineralogy in the mountain that could reproduce the manganese iron ratio that we find in the Samoa uh, basalt suite. Okay, and so the take home message of this diagram is okay, so. It's consistent with what we expect. We have actually an Icelandic mantle that is more rich in olivine and opaques, so closer to a periodic source, and a Samoa mantle that is more rich in garnet and cephalic, so closer to the pyroxenite source. But the most, the most important take home message of this plot is there is a huge overlap and there is a large, large range of mineralogy that can actually explain this ratio. So I don't consider that as a success. When I see this huge range of mineralogy in the time frame, one particular ratio. We can do the same exercise with zinc, and we have the same kind of things. We have some kind of separation that is consistent with what we expect is a theory, but a large range of mineralogy that can explain both ratio. So alone, these exchange coefficients are not that helpful to define the mineralogy of the mountains. But if we combine them, they 
become a much more, more powerful tool to actually define the mineralogy of the mountain. And this is what is represented here. We are looking at two different projections, just for Iceland, in a ternary diagram, looking at four phase. It's messy. So for a second, we are just looking at 3D. Look how that looks. Okay. So this is just. Just want to make sure that I'm right. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the same view, except that it's rotated by 60 degrees. Right now, I'm just looking at the data for manganese Fe ratio. Sarah, can I just ask something for clarification? So the uh, x, the fraction of garnet, is that the fraction of garnet that I melt, or is it the fraction of garnet that comes up at home? So is, in in that is a is a fraction of garnet in the source. But remember, it's a very simple model right now. It's just a proof of concept with a, uh, a batch melting process. So it needs more work than it does. But those are the fraction in the source. Oops, no. So it worked before. Am I? Okay, I'm just going to escape just for a second. And just do that. Oh, no, no, that's me, that's me. No, no that's okay, I, I get it. There we go. Let's do that this yep. way. Okay, so right now, manganese iron ratio, okay, in a 3D projection, rotated by 60 degrees in comparison to the other one. And so you will see the zinc iron ratio pop up over there. And the thing is, we are looking at a simple model. So technically, we have four phase that we are looking at for now, olivine, opaque, sepix, and garnet in a 3D diagrams. So all my solution, of course, fall on one single plan for one single ratio. It's simply because I use only four phase in my model. If I was using more phase, I will have a volume, OK? So proof of concept. So if you have actually two different plan in a ternary diagram and you look at what is the intersection between the two, the intersection fall along a line. Okay, so that's just what I wanted to show. And so now I can go back if I manage. Oh, I do not. The presentation mode, so what is that? Okay, so it was just to explain this very messy plot. And so the result of that is if you look at this inter intersection between these two, it's a line in 3D. And so I can still project this line with the Pinocchio and Garnet ratio on this ternary diagram. And this is what I got from the intersection of both manganese iron ratio and zinc iron ratio for the Iceland data. Okay, I can do the same thing for Samoa. Something for phase three D to a line, and this is where I, there is their plot. And so now you see that when we combine the FRP ratio, the exchange coefficient for the FRP ratio, we can define the mineralogy of the source way better than when we use one single partition, one single exchange coefficient. So this is just a comparison to what is what we got by using only M and FE ratio. So the take-home message of that is. FRTs are they using useful to actually identify the lithology of the mountain? Alone, not so much. If you combine them, then they can be very powerful. Okay, so just to remind you, what we did is we actually calculated the average mineralogical assemblage. But in reality, what people want to know is how much pyroxenite you have in your mountain, because this is what has geodynamical application for that. What we suggest is our approach could become a first step approach for this classical model of a lithological model. Because when you look at what we have done, it is clear now that it will not make sense to choose the exact same lithology, two lithologies, to actually model the melting of the mountain beneath Iceland and the, the melting beneath, beneath Samoa. The mountain beneath Iceland, the average mineralogy that we calculated is close to a peridotite, a pyroxene rich peridotite or an olivine rich websterite. 
with a moderate fraction of garnet into it, which is similar to what has been suggested before for Iceland, with the little g just as kg1 and kg2. KG2. But the model that we got from Samoa is a very little g that is way more refractory with a much higher mode of garnet. And this is consistent with the much higher melting of pressure beneath Samoa because of the presence of a very thick lithosphere. So what we suggest is, again, our approach become a step one to better actually constrain the average mineralogy of your mountain and serve as new input parameter to choose what kind of lithologies can actually be present in the different mountain source depending on the geological context. Okay, so take a message. The proof of concept shows that F40s can be very powerful tool to constrain the lithology of the mountain if they are combined. We did a very simple model. So the next step is to do Monte Carlo simulation where we can add way more parameters into it, look at fractional melting, look at more mineral phases. I haven't talked about um, Spinel, for example, but Spinel will have a big impact on zinc because zinc is very compatible with Spinel, et cetera, et cetera. We still need more data, more experimental data. Of course, there are actually only two or three experimental studies that has been dedicated to FRTs so far. And I would also encourage people to, when they do laser ICP session, it's not going to take that much time to analyze also a few FRTs. So why not put that in your routine? So we actually increase the data of natural cities. This is particularly important because we mean lack of data. And for example, I haven't talked about nickel today. Uh, nickel is has been suggested as a good tracer for lithological heterogeneity. But nickel is extremely challenging to investigate experimentally because you lose it through graphite, you lose it through platinum, you lose it through everything. So it's super hard experimentally to do that. So using natural sample instead of experimental data for nickel is a good way to basically get more data. We have data on olivine, but not so much on any other phases. <laughs> and I'm going to stop here with this beautiful xenolith that comes from less than three hours from here from the Sadiaros uh, preservation. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions for Sarah. Let's start off with a student question. So, students, if you have any questions, let's start off with one of you. Go ahead. Great talk, thank you. Um, so I'm wondering in the when you took all the natural like bulk composition and then found kind of a regression of the PEDs, um, I think you said you, you attributed the spread um, to disequilibrium and maybe like analytical uncertainties. Um, I'm wondering if because you said you use like echocytes, archocytes, um, like maybe metasomatic peroxides, if any of that spread could be from bulk composition. That's an excellent question. And that's the first thing we have to be checked to see if there is actually an effect of the lithology, different type of lithology, of the bulk composition, of the mineral composition. We try many, many, many different parameters, none of them get detected. And also, the thing that is telling me that uh, the, the precision of the data doesn't count is we also try to see do we have a difference between laser analysis and uh, the whole global database. Assuming that the laser analysis are a bit more precise for the, the, the minor elements or the trace elements, and we still get basically the same thing. So, other questions from students? Maybe? Okay, let's open it up. Well, actually, we can continue. There is one exception. We can try to go through tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And Sarah, if I may ask you uh, to repeat the questions once they ask for the Zoom crowd. Uh, other questions? Ananya. So, yeah, you mentioned that, you know, illustrating uh, the amount of these heterogeneities in the mental is sort of the ultimate goal, and a question that we always get asked. Um, so, what are your thoughts on how to address that? moving forward 
I guess more specifically, what I'm thinking is, um, well, depending on the melting reactions, every mineral, every mineral or every metallurgy will have a different contribution to the melting process. And then you have to use that to trace back the proportion of that particular metallurgy in the source. Okay. I, I'm going to try it. So, so yeah. the question was, uh, how cool can we actually? Uh, so the big problem, the big question that we are, uh, me and Anania, for example, they try always to answer is how much pyroxenide do we have in the mantle? Uh, so there, there is actually two parts to this question. There is the part of finding the proportion of pyroxenide in the melt, and then we still have to find the proportion of pyroxenide that was back in the mantle by doing an inverse model to calculate this proportion. So how can we do that moving forward? Um, well, I, I actually do think that what I showed this morning is one way to at least make some progress about it because you and I did basically the same thing initially is we have to do some assumption about what kind of pathologies are present in the mantle anyway. You can do that with inverse model, forward model, Monte Carlo simulation, but you still have to do some assumption. And so far, those assumptions were based on, okay, what is the composition of recycling first? What is the composition? What is the composition of natural pyroxenite we find in the field? Me, both of them, as you know, as downside and, and outside, basically. This new approach suggests to see as an independent way to quantify the average mineralogical model. Uh, mineralogical distribution in the model. So for me, showing that, it shows that this can serve as a very nice input parameter to see if we can actually have a better consistency between all different models, if we actually take this difference of mythology uh, into account. That would be interesting to do the same exercise we did before we are, when we had so much difference between our two models, basically, but this time by actually changing the input parameter to have lithologies that are better um, constrained uh, as a function of the geodynamic atmosphere. Does he answer your question? Yeah, and I think we can talk about this. Uh, I think one of the concerns that I have is, um, well, so you said that we have this two lithology mantle, right? But then- Oh, well, at least. Well, to start with, that's the assumption, right? But then we know that you can form multiple other lithologies by reaction. Yeah. And that just messes up the whole thing. But it has geodynamic you know, implications, right? So yeah. do you think we are at a level where we can address that complication or? So the metal met prop reaction? Yeah, also? yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's always a very complicated part. Met prop, met -prop reaction, if you take everything and that's a very, I'm not saying that Maybe I'm being but, uh, I guess it depends on the time scale you are looking at. Uh, if you are looking at, uh, uh, I do think that, for example, there are some studies that look at the evolution of the mantle source uh, uh, beneath Hawaii on a very short time scale. Uh, if you, if you, if you do that on a very short time scale, I do think that this, the, the approach that we have having are still good because we might not have a perfectly quantitative result, but we will see basically the evolution of the mountain source uh, with time basically on the short term state. And I do think that that provides valuable information where on this particular question, the metrop reaction are not going to be that important anyway, because we just want to see what is the average evolution of the mineralogy of the source on this particular time state. So I think it depends if we are talking about big geodynamical amplification and convection and recycling processes, then metal reaction, we have to deal with them, but I don't have a straightforward way as it's going to act. I just have a little bit of a falling off of the first question. Uh, so, and it might be very basic, it might be a step up. So, you said like the samples are not equal. Uh, so yeah. I was just wondering, like, the equilibrium in terms of what, and, uh, what degree of these equilibrium are in those samples, which you need to constrain probably the scatter rate. Yeah, um, I'm just looking at. That. Okay, so I had a few slides. I probably missed one slide. I could have shown. Uh, 
One thing we have done is we calculated the equilibrium temperature of these samples using different thermometers, geothermometer, assuming some constant pressure, looking at what is the effect of pressure. Anyway, I'm passing on the detail here. Uh, uh, and, and clearly, when we compare for samples where we have three different phases, and so we can actually use two different geothermometers, and we compare the temperature of equilibration between these two different thermometers, most of the samples show very striking different temperature. I'm talking more than 100 degree difference. So this is a clear evidence for disequilibrium in the sample. So that's the first thing. We haven't shown we show that yet. The second thing is uh, when we look at is there a temperature, def temperature dependence of the partition coefficient uh, for mineral mineral partition coefficients, we know that there is one for mineral melt partition coefficients. Do we have one? For mineral mineral partition coefficient. This is what we got, for example, for garnet kyokyoxen as a function of one particular uh, thermometer. And we clearly have the temperature dependence. Not that this is a dark scale, because this was not a lot scale. So we have uh, a big temperature dependence. But when we look at the same thing for other minerals, uh, two kyokyoxen, two kyokyoxen, uh, Manganese foam, forget about the line for now. Okay. Uh, if you just look at the data point, there is no correlation at all. Does it mean that it's not dependent on temperature? I don't think so. I think it's just the scatter is so high and the disequilibrium is so high that we lose this correlation. And the best evidence for that is those lines are actually strong correlation that was defined in a previous study on a very small set of peridotite samples that were chosen, especially because very well equilibrated. And when they do that, they do actually find a very strong correlation with temperature for this particular coefficient. So the only reason we don't see correlation here is because our samples are not well equilibrated. Yeah, our why, samples. Why Oh, that's because uh, all the elements do not diffuse at the same sp at the same speed. We are looking at the samples, natural samples under subsolidus sub conditions. So the equilibration temperature for some elements depend on the mineral species you are looking at. And so garnet, and I don't have the number in my mind, but manganese is not going to diffuse at the same speed in garnet and in kinokyoxen. And so eventually you will lose your initial equilibrium by difference of uh, and that you cannot take into consideration in the data collection well that's the thing then you are it's basically what do you do um, you can so do experiments or you can look at all your global data set and select only the very well equilibrated data this is i mean it's going to first reduce a lot the number of data you are in your in your system and again Basically, completely equilibrated natural samples does not exist. It was doable for peridotite because also there is way more data for peridotite than pyroxenite. Pyroxenite, on top of that, you have to take into account the large range of composition, etc. What we were trying to prove is instead of actually trying to reach perfect equilibrium, either in experiments or in natural samples, if you use the necessary high number of samples, the facts are not that equilibrated, is not going to matter on the determination of the exchange coefficient. It's true for exchange coefficient. It's not true for partitioning coefficient. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, please ask, um, what oxygen capacity differences in the series of the that's a good question. I'm going to ask you to repeat it, yeah. Sarah. So uh, the question is, uh, can oxygen fugacity affect the exchange coefficient and the partition coefficient? And that's a good question. And uh, we haven't, we, it was a plan to look at that. We, we haven't actually had the time to look at that. So we assume that the oxygen fugacity is the same, which is clearly not the case. Now, that being said, some, uh, some FRTs are very affected by oxygen fugacity. Vanadium, okay, uh, typically, but not all FRTs are, are affected by oxygen fugacity. 
or if they are not in the range of oxygen fugacity we expect in the mantle basically for this condition. So yes, that might affect the behavior of vanadium, but it's not going to affect the behavior of manganese or nickel, for example. Other questions? Sorry. Okay. Just wondering um, if you can use this, this combined ratio uh, probability to look at uh, actual data from primitive partner cells. If you use this ratio, do you think you can be accurate in distinguishing sources? So the question is, can I use this technique and the different uh, FRTs ratio to determine the source of uh, primitive half magmas? Let's try. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried, so, so we, we can test it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, in the uh, similar and the Python example, what like magnesium number or the magnesium half is like <laughs> so the question is, uh, I use a lava suite from our uh, so from uh, Iceland and another lava suite from Samoa. And uh, um, Lisa was asking he, at which MG number did I cut the selection to get rid of uh, fractionation process and to make sure that I'm only dealing with primitive magma. And my answer is I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I will look for it before tomorrow. <laughs> I may I have two probably very uh, uh, you know semantic questions maybe, but I'm curious in, in, in your parlance, how what is would you say that the partition coefficient is the same thing as the distribution coefficient? Are they the same thing? How would you define these distribution coefficients? I, I'm just curious in terms of the semantics. You sometimes you use partition, sometimes you use distribution. If I did that, yeah, in it, my head be... it was probably the same. What what is not the same is partition exchange. in exchange. Right, 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 right. If I if I use distribution, it was probably just. Uh, yeah. just I mean, but but I, I've seen it in the literature as well. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, but I, for, think, for, I think people use it in exchange. I, I do. I do think people yeah use both uh, terminology for the same thing. But I mean, it's D. I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's D. Exactly, that's exactly. And then I guess, other... I guess, I guess people use partition coefficients more when they really refer to partitioning with a liquid. Maybe I'm wrong, but the, uh, why distribution? Maybe it would be better to use distribution here because we are looking at mineral minerals. That's that's I a see. possibility. Yeah, I see. And then uh, on your uh, the. Uh, Basically, the plot that you were fitting lines to, yeah. uh, when you had the garnet, and the um, yeah. you had the x-axis for thermopropsy. Um, what's the uh, just gen yeah? What, any one of these? Yeah. What what uncertainty are we talking about in the x versus the y roughly on measurement itself? Well, I have them here. This is a one standard deviation, basically. Sorry, where is it? The here is it? What you? Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. So that's. Uh, but that's on the slope. That's though. on the slope. Yeah. I'm wondering in the in the actual measurement itself, okay. what, what is the rough uncertainty? Is that you know is it ten percent? Is it fifty percent? Uh, so so I I don't have the number, but it's small. It's, 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 it is okay. small for this ratio, manganese iron. But again, that's a problem. Uh, as I said before, manganese used to be basically part of analysis for many years. People didn't really care. We were at 0.10 for a kilo for percent, we were thinking it's good enough. We actually did some error propagation to see what would be the result of that. And there are those are basically based on error propagation. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. So the problem is that is the, if you look at the analytical error on this manganese, mm -hmm. if you look at the literature, the analytical error is actually not that high because it's a minor element, it's not even sure. a trace element, it's relatively easy to analyze at the prop. But people have been less careful at uh, looking at this manganese data when they published the data like 10 years ago, or even now today, if they don't care about mm -hmm. FRTs. Mm -hmm. Because for a long time, manganese was just an element that we were yeah. putting here just to make sure that our total fit to 100. Yeah. So it's a hard question to answer because that's just not an, that was just not an element of interest before. 
Yeah. Now I was just curious also because your errors are going to be correlated because you're regressing. Yeah, but we, we did error propagation to find this range. I'm just saying that the X error and the Y error correlate because you have manganese in both as well on top of that. But right? we so did, we, we, we actually got it, got it, got it. enter that into our error yeah, propag yeah. propagation calculations. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question for anyone who has it. Yeah. Just one quick curiosity, like, uh, so this do does this liquid process, for example, like the pyroxene and hydrochloric, like, like melting of this, like, so it to be like volatile content in this primary matrix as well? Like, the one would be more uh, favorable. That's not, that's not a question for any other than for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, What's the question? I, so if, oh, yeah, sorry. So the question is. Uh, uh, if we have volatiles in the mantle source, are uh, one type of lithology more likely to uh, contribute to the proportion of volatiles we find in the basalt? Uh, there are actually very few data about that, but then we can just uh, think about it for a while. Uh, if we consider that most of the pyroxenides that are in the mantle come from recycling processes of the oceanic lithosphere, it's more likely that those pyroxenides are going to be more, hydro uh, more hydrated and more carbonated than the bulk mantle. But it's a very good question, and, uh, and there are a few experimental data that actually deal with, uh, <laughs> deal with this subject, but, uh, but I don't have an absolute answer to that. Technically, clinopyroxene also can hold much more water than olivine, like all the, the, the experiments are showing that. So, if you combine all these parameters together, yes, there is very, uh, it's much more likely that pyroxenite are going to be richer in water than pyrotype are, and so eventually they will contribute more to, uh, to, to the proportion of volatiles in your printing. So just like a comment to that, and maybe that's a follow-up to Harry's question as well. I think investigating the effect of water or other volatiles of partitioning can actually help us go to our results as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. something that we don't have right now. But yeah. more yeah. stuff for us to do. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many experiments. <laughs> All right, let's give Sarah a round of applause. Thank you very much. A quick request to position the tables back. Thank you very much. Close this over here.